Uh, hi, uh, I'm Sadashiva Pai from uh, Science Mission. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Uh, Newport from NC State. She's the professor of psychology there. Uh, she's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America and the American Psychological Association and currently serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Gerontology, Psychological Sciences. Her research interests include contextual and individual differences surrounding stressors and well-being outcomes. In particular, she is interested in the psycho psychosocial and sociodemographic characteristics of individuals along with changing contextual factors which may be related to emotional, physical, and cognitive reactivity to stressors. Welcome, Dr. Newport. Thank you. Can you please talk about uh, your background, interest, and uh, your some of the works you're doing? I uh, went to high school in Seattle. I grew up there. And then I went to college in Pepperdine University, which is in mm -hmm. California. Okay. And I thought I wanted to be a physician. So I was a biology major for almost mm -hmm. two years before I met organic chemistry. The two of mm -hmm. us did not get along. Okay. Um, I I realized that I needed to find something that I found interesting and was more passionate about uh -huh. um, without struggling to really try to sog my way through it. So I found psychology, which uh, was a really nice way to stick with the science that appealed to me. And mm -hmm. then also to be able to bring in human behavior and uh, to try to really develop my passion for uh, thinking about ways to improve health and well-being, especially in older adults. So I got my degree at Pepperdine Psychology, and then I went to Western Washington University for my master's in general psychology. Mm -hmm. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do at that time, but I knew I really liked research and academ academia in general. So I got a master's in their program, which focused on measurement, evaluation, and statistical analysis. Mm -hmm. Turns out I love statistics. Okay. I just love them. Where I really was like, this is fantastic. Uh, so then I went to Arizona for my PhD, which is in family studies and human development. And my minor for my PhD is statistics. Okay. So after my postdoc at Brandeis, mm -hmm. I'm now at NC State, where I was hired as a quantitative psychologist. OK. and. Uh Tell us something about your lab, lab people. Graduate. Yeah, I currently have two graduate students, one okay. who is in her third year and one just started with me. Mm -hmm. And I have six undergraduate students for this semester. Okay. So next semester, uh, some of the undergraduates are uh, graduating. I'll have new ones coming in and I'm recruiting new graduate students to the lab as well. So those numbers always tend to fluctuate. But right now there's nine of us. We have one meeting. Okay. And how do you motivate this bunch of kids? Yeah, I like to make sure that each person has something that they care about that they're working on. So mm -hmm. I meet individually with the graduate students each week mm -hmm. and we talk about their progress in their lab related work, but also in their coursework in the program of study in general. Mm -hmm. And then I meet with the undergraduates in our weekly lab meetings and then as need, I meet with them also because they each are working on their own project. Their first semester in the lab, I have them go to a local uh, conference. So they either mm -hmm. present a poster or give a talk at a local conference on a project that they care about. Mm -hmm. And then their second semester, they work on writing up that conference presentation for a publication. So many of them are now working on finishing up their papers for a journal article. So I meet with them go over more complicated analyses that may, they maybe haven't covered in their undergraduate work. And so I, I try to make sure that they are working on something that they find interesting, and then I kind of move alongside them in that. OK, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, can you talk about uh, some of the role models, mentors you had in your career? Yes, I've been very fortunate to have many excellent role models and mentors. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was at Pepperdine, um, I actually uh, had a wonderful statistics professor that people may have heard of for different reasons, uh, Dr. Christine Blasey, as I knew her then, now Christine Blasey Ford. She was my statistics professor and she really got me excited about stats. So I'm very grateful to her for um, kind of turning me on to that field. And uh, Cindy Miller Perrin is also at Pepperdine. She's still there. She uh, really has a passion for psychology and um, has been a 
fantastic mentor in terms of how to think about doing academia and balancing family. And then Leslie McDonald Meshack was my master's advisor. Mm -hmm. um, I was only with her for two years because it was a short master's program, but she encouraged me to continue on my degree search. And I went to Arizona where I uh, worked with Dave Almeida. This really mm -hmm. shaped a lot of my thinking and how daily stressors and daily events are powerful predictors of uh, daily health and well-being. And uh, he's also just a, a fantastic person. And then Margie Lockman uh, was my mentor at uh, Brandeis University, where I did my postdoc. And um, she really helped me understand and think about people's perceptions of control, which is different from the actual control they may have, but their perception of it and how it can be important for uh, shaping one's environment or trying to achieve certain goals. And so I think you'll see all, all of those kinds of topics woven in throughout my, uh, mm -hmm. my research talk that I'll give shortly. And uh, like, I know you have small kids, so how do you spend time other than research? Yeah, yeah, so my children are small, they are uh, five and three. And uh, my husband is also in academia. So okay. um, it's nice to have a partner who understands the, the ebb and flow of the work. And sometimes, you know, when he's at the gym in the evening, I'm sitting down and I'm making editorial decisions. Or um, mm -hmm. when the kids are sick, you know, we kind of decide who is going to stay home that day. Uh, we try to teach on alternate days of the week. So I teach on Mondays and Wednesdays. My husband teaches on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it's pretty clear who stays home if a child gets sick on one of those days. <laughs> um, so we do our best to try to try to manage that. But sometimes, you know, it doesn't work out that well. My husband was at a conference in Germany and our youngest got sick. And so I had to take him to class with me because nobody else could teach my class. And so uh -huh. I lectured on power analysis with a two-year-old on my hip. And the class was like, this is interesting, no, but it worked. Like you just kind of okay. make do. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like there's a lot of integration that happens in, in work and family. Okay. And uh, coming back to the stressors, so what made you got interested in the stressors and uh, what you are doing right now? Yeah, I, um, for stress specifically, I would, think back to my time at Arizona when I was working with Dave Almeida because he's very interested in how the daily stressful events that people encounter really shape how we um, how we think about and interact with our health and well-being on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. uh, he, he has a lot of work and he's really formed my thinking and how daily stressors are powerful predictors that we need to pay attention to. So some of my work now is on why, how we can maybe try to prevent or reduce the impact of the stressors when they do happen. So that's uh, that's where I'm leaning towards now. And my work in general, focusing on uh, how aging related uh, processes may be important, really tied back to the strong relationships I had with my grandparents when I was okay. young. And even now, I, my, my grandfather is 96. I'm fortunate wow. to still have a, a living grandparent. So that's nice. um, it's, uh, yeah, I've, I've always had positive views about aging. So mm -hmm. the negative stereotypes that tend to be pervasive in the U.S. culture, at least uh, around aging, I wasn't really exposed to until later in my adult life. So it's mm -hmm. um, it's kind of formed why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, can you please present your work, please? Oh, the... thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me share my screen. So I swept. Here we go. So I've called this daily well-being because it's a it's a it's a broad context under which a lot of my research falls. And I've been very fortunate to receive funding uh, from local uh, university support as well as uh, the national uh, various national uh, external research sources. And um, I'm really interested in these daily processes because I like to start with this visual. I feel like a lot of how we uh, perceive our lives or interact with the, with the events in our lives come down to things that might happen to us on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. certainly major events like retirement or getting married or death of a spouse or death of a parent, those are very important things that happen. Um, I, I, I don't seek to minimize those at all. But when we look at uh, previous research that has focused on 
the predictive power of those major life events alongside the smaller, uh, seemingly more minor daily events, like arguments are getting stuck in traffic. It's mm -hmm. the daily events that are more important in terms of predicting health and well-being. So there's a lot of work to be done to understand how these daily things that, that we might think of as the daily grind are actually really um, important things that we need to spend a lot of focus on. And so I'm interested in the sources of variability and how uh, people may be different from each other in their health and well-being. So these emojis represent differences between people. Some people are less healthier, happy than others. So the, the person on the left, right, the, you know, tears of laughter, like just, uh, you know, so happy and having a fabulous time. They look very different than the person on the far right who seems to be very sad. So those are important differences between people. But in my work, I'm also interested in the daily variation. So this within person or fluctuating state where some days are less happy or healthy than others. And so if we look at the the emoji on the far left, you know, even one day that person is reporting being very sad. And on the far right, the person who in general looks quite sad has some uh, at least one day of being quite happy. So there's important differences that we can look at between people, but then I'm also interested in the fluctuations within people. And the way that I look at that is by asking people the same questions every day for a series of consecutive days. So I use daily diary design to try to get at both of these sources of variability. So I have three overlapping and related areas of interest that I focus on in my research. And mm -hmm. so I look at reactivity distressors or how people respond to stressors after the event has already happened. I'm also interested in what predicts things that come before the stressors, the antecedents of how we might respond in a resilient way. And then lastly, I'm interested in the timescales over which these processes occur, whether they're short or long-term indications of inter-individual variability. So the first one that I'll talk about is reactivity distressors. And Dave Almeida, who is my uh, PhD advisor, developed this conceptual model where he talks about reactivity distressors. So on the left-hand side, the purple box, integrates these individual differences or differences between people, whether it might be personality or perceptions of control over one's life, these control beliefs, age differences. Those may predict how much stress we are exposed to, so that stressor exposure blue box, but they also may predict how we react to the stressors once they happen, which is the, the lower blue box here. And so I'm interested in both the exposure piece, so how many stressors we experience, and then also the reactivity or the vulnerability to them when they do happen. And the characteristics of the stressors are important to consider. So how many of them, what they are about, the content, the severity, um, how people think about them in terms of the appraisal or the goals uh, that are relevant to their lives, whether it's a, a loss or a threat or a challenge in some way. So these are the thoughts that people have, the appraisals around the event itself. And then importantly, how all of these things feed into well-being on a daily basis. So I'm interested in outcomes like psychological stress, might be emotional well-being would be another way to think about that, uh, daily physical symptoms, and cognition. And then these things can be part of a feedback loop where this process starts over again. So the first thing I want to share is this idea of the content of the stressors. Um, the data that I'll present first are from the National Study of Daily Experiences. It's a national telephone, telephone interview that took place on eight consecutive evenings for each participant. There were 1,031 adults across all 50 states in the US. They're age 25 to 74. And there's a lot of information that came from these telephone interviews. The three variables that I'll focus on right now are the daily psychological distress or the, the negative mood that people might report on a given day. Uh, there are a number of physical health symptoms and then the daily stressors that they were exposed to. So uh, Dave Almeida, who is the project uh, uh, principal investigator of this project, um, generated an inventory of how uh, people can report their daily stressors. So it's a series of seven questions where people were asked if they had an argument or disagreement on a given day, if they had anything stressful happen at work, if they had anything stressful happen at home, anything that might have happened to a close friend or family member that turned out to be stressful for them. So these are 
called uh, social network stressors. And if anybody answered yes to those questions, then they were asked to describe what happened. So I wanna share just a, a quick example of a work stressor that a participant reported. So this person said, yes, there was something stressful that happened at work. I ran out of something at work, some pop, 7-Up. They were late bringing it, so it was stressful. Just not being able to provide it is stressful. During lunchtime, I don't like being without it. It is important. I want people to have a choice. Uh, so on the surface, you might think, well, this isn't really something that's a big deal. It's just a, you know, okay, ran out of 7-Up. Um, but if this person was in charge of running a restaurant and had to constantly remind the servers and the patrons that, I'm sorry, 7-Up is not available, um, you could imagine that for someone who really valued their job and had a responsibility as a manager that this could be a stressful situation. So when people told us that something stressful happened and they were able to articulate this kind of a narrative around it, we believed them. So we didn't we didn't try to assign uh, judgment about whether or not something uh, rose to the level of being trusted. And this is the point where I get to cite Tina Fey. So she has this uh, chart, which of course, you know, she's a comedian, so she, it's rather silly, but I think it nicely articulates how we can think about different jobs differently. So on the vertical axis, the Y axis, of course, is not to scale, it jumps from five to 100 to 1 million. This is what she calls the daily stress level of various jobs. So the first bar on the left is writing for SNL, and then we have acting on SNL, which apparently in her mind is significantly different from her 30 Rock writing job. So writing for 30 Rock apparently for her is more difficult than acting on SNL. Um, then we jump to coal mining in the US compared to Chile. There don't appear to be significant differences there according to her. Uh, next bar is being a baby. And then following business boys who do stuff with money, I really don't know. Uh, and then the highest bar is active military service. The very last bar is managing a Chili's on Friday night. This is somewhat tongue in cheek, but the idea is we um, people who are in these jobs know their jobs and they know their stress levels the best. And so um, we need to we need to also imagine that um, the, the person reporting uh, is going to be the best. Um, the best uh, insight that we have into their to their work stress on a given day. So the next next example is from a social network stressor. Uh, so this respondent said, "Yes, something happened uh, to my best friend. Her wedding plans got canceled because of me. We were supposed to be at the hall to view the chapel and put the money down, but because we were late, we didn't get it. Someone else did. So now we're going to have to have it at my house, which throws my life upside down for two days. I have to rearrange my whole house, clean, all in two days, and with three kids." So certainly the difference between running out of 7-Up and having a wedding now at your house, those are very different kinds of experiences. Um, and so participants also told us how stressful they found these events. So we have an indication of their stress. Um, but this just represents the, the different domains these daily stressors can occur. So we're interested in the third page and how people respond to stress in these various domains. So on this in this paper, on the vertical axis, I'm predicting daily psychological distress or daily negative mood. And these red lines indicate people's responses to the increases in stressors. So a, a steep line would be a worse response, it means that they are reacting more strongly to the stressor. So in this case, we're looking at interpersonal stressors. These would be arguments and disagreements that someone would have on a given day. And this is the result of a three-way interaction. So I've broken up the figure based on how high or low people feel, uh, people reported feeling in their personal control or their feelings of control beliefs over their life. So on the left-hand side, the people who report feeling a high amount of constraint are people who feel like there's a lot of obstacles in their way from the environment that are preventing them from meeting their goals. So people on the left-hand side don't feel like they have a lot of control over their lives. And you can see that each of those slopes are positive for the young, middle, and older participants. Uh, but it's the younger people, the red line, that is the speech out of all of them. So younger people are the most reactive increases in interpersonal stressors compared to those in midlife and in older ages. And if we look at the right side of the figure, people who feel that they do not have a lot of obstacles in their way, they feel like they actually have a decent amount of control, those lines are not, they do have a positive slope, but they're not as steep as on the left. So 
uh, having high amounts of control is equally beneficial for all age groups on the right hand side. So what we see is why is it that younger adults are having such a problem? Uh, there's a socio-emotional selectivity theory that suggests that emotion regulation increases with age. So we become experts in our own environments and middle age and older people have more experience responding to stressors. So perhaps we're seeing some strengths associated with aging, but younger people are still trying to figure out um, how they can regulate their emotions uh, in, in these somewhat novel experiences in terms of their life stage. Uh, we've also applied this reactivity uh, effect in looking at aging attitudes. So the previous study was about how old people actually were. And in this study where we had only older people aged 60 to 96, we asked them to report how they felt about their aging. So people who felt really positive about their aging might say something like, I'm just as happy now as I was when I was younger. But someone who may feel negative about their aging may say something like, things keep getting worse as I get older. So the attitude towards own aging, that ATOA acronym, is represented in these two lines on this figure. And people who felt pretty negative about their aging were much more reactive to daily stressors when they increased. So this uh, positive line is quite steep for people who felt that their aging was not going well. So these aging attitudes, um, if they were negative, were almost a vulnerability factor, or uh, like a stress diathesis. They, they um, increased negative affect in response to stressors. We've also looked at these aging attitudes generally um, and how they may interact with daily experiences about aging. So in this paper, which again focused on a sample of exclusively older adults, we asked people to report each day on their awareness of age-related change experiences. So this AARC acronym that appears on the horizontal axis of the figure here refers to awareness of age-related change experiences. So these are things that highlight aging. They aren't necessarily stressors, uh, but maybe they might function as stressors. So we asked people uh, to report on how frequently each day they might have an awareness of age-related change events where something might be like, um, I felt today that my memory was slower than usual because of my aging. So that would be a loss-based event where they felt like their aging was highlighted and it was not a positive association. So for people who felt in general, looking at this black line, for people who felt in general that their aging was going really well, when they had increases in these daily arc experiences, so they felt like their uh, memory was slower on a given day and other kinds of daily experiences that might highlight their aging, they were the ones who were the most reactive to um, those experiences. They had the worst negative mood or their, their negative mood increased the most. So it's somewhat interesting that we might think, oh, it's always good to feel great about your aging, but this would suggest that that's not always true. If you feel really good about your aging, but then you're confronted with a daily experience that might confront your, or challenge your uh, date, your every the more general perception, um, those people would be the most vulnerable to those kinds of daily experiences. We've also applied um, this reactivity paradigm to substance use and substance craving. And so in a sample of offenders, exclusively men, um, we had people call into an interactive voice response survey line. So when they were released from jail, we uh, recruited them into the study and they were given a 1-800 number that they could call each day for 14 days. And there were of course the missing data, but the nice thing about this paradigm or this method is that uh, people who are released from jail don't always have a stable place to go. So regardless of where they might be staying, as long as they could find a phone, a pay phone or someone else's phone, they could freely participate in the study. So what we were able to show is here we're predicting illegal drug cravings. So uh, men, we were all men in this case, men who did not have a lot of prior treatment for their substance use, that they would be reflected on the red line. They were the most reactive to increases in daily stressors. Their daily illegal drug craving increased substantially more compared to the men who had been in prior treatment many times. Uh, we also use these same predictors for the actual use of illegal drugs. And again, 
prior treatment seems to be beneficial, where the red line suggests that men who had not had a lot of prior treatment uh, were more likely to use drugs with increases in stressors. I've titled this slide the bright side of prior treatment uh, because there also appears to be an upside of prior treatment. Here I'm predicting the frequency of stressors the next day. And in this instance, it's the black line that is uh, the positive slope. So the men who had been in prior treatment many times, and for some of these men that was 30 times, so they've been in treatment many times, they had a steeper slope that linked their drug use yesterday with their stress for exposure the next day. And we think it's possible that men who have needed to be in treatment up to 30 times may have an especially pernicious drug use problem or an addiction. And so it might reflect the severity of their addiction, uh, but they also may have been in treatment many times and are aware that um, drug use yesterday puts them at higher risk for uh, exposure to stressors the next day. So what I'd like to do in the future is to work with a colleague in my department, Sarah Demeray, who is a co-author on that paper. And we have access to all of the Wake County Jail bookings, 67,000, slightly more than that, over a period of several years. And we would like to look at uh, the scale of the opioid crisis within our particular county to see if we can descriptively understand how the national epidemic might be playing out locally and also to see if it's getting worse over time because we do have multiple years of data. So if we could ask about contextual and individual differences that might modify increases in opioid use, something that I'm of course would be interested in would be whether there would be age differences in the uh, trends of increases over time. So is it possible that older adults might be more vulnerable uh, to increased opioid use because of age-related pain that they might be experiencing? So that's something that we might see um, as, as we look at these data. So that's something I'd like to do in the near future. The next area that I would like to describe in terms of my work would be the antecedents, what comes before the stress itself. And so I recently put together a special section for the Journal of Gerontology Psych Sciences. And together with some co-authors, we decided to generate a conceptual model that tries to explain or at least articulate the ways in which we think age differences might be playing out in the processes before stress is before we anticipate or before we um, are exposed to stress. So this is the conceptual model that we articulated, and this uh, red box that I've highlighted, this area to the right, essentially summarizes all of the work that goes into my uh, reactivity piece of the of the research that I'm doing. So the stress occurs on the bottom, and then there's a stress response, which may be modified by coping in some way, and it uh, feeds into important outcomes we may care about. So this red box has been thoroughly studied uh, in my lab and in many other labs. Um, it's really important work about what happens after this happens. But what we wanted to do in this particular special section was to talk about all the processes that might occur before stress. So proactive coping would be efforts that someone would use to try to prevent a stressor or to modify it before it happens. So it's not quite as bad when it does happen. Um, there's also anticipatory stress, which we broke into two different kinds of uh, constructs. Stressor forecasting is the prediction that a stressful event will happen. So do you think anything stressful will happen today? So it's a specified or defined time frame. So it's predicting an event, whereas stress anticipation is the prediction of a few. So it's the expectation of stress level in a defined time frame. So how stressful do you expect today will be? So the stress forecasting is prediction of an event, whereas stress anticipation is prediction of a feeling. And we think both of these may be really important for an anticipatory stress response, that they may be directly related to these important uh, outcomes that have been a feature of many of the uh, stress research up until now. Anticipatory coping would be coping that is uh, in preparation for a stressor that is likely to happen. It can no longer be avoided. It is likely to be coming in the future. So what can people do to prepare for the consequences of that stressor that can no longer be avoided? So we took these pieces and uh, in my lab, we've been very interested in forecaster things because we have these different domains of stressors. We ask people to make a prediction for the next day to forecast their stress 
know, how likely is it that you would have an argument, or an avoidable argument, at work or a home stressor, social network stressor. Um, and we see that there are a lot of individual differences. That's the blue part of these pie charts. But there's also a lot of fluctuation across the day. So there's within person variability that's represented by these red pieces of pie. So we have uh, evidence to suggest that forecasts are made in a contextually specific and changing way within a person over time. So we found that that was interesting. And then we wanted to look to see if those forecasts were important for how people responded to the stressors that they forecasted about. So in this particular figure, we're looking at the domain of home stressors. And in our sample, this, this usually was people feeling they had too much to do at home or needed to do some sort of household maintenance. And we have younger adults represented on the left-hand side of the figure and older adults represented on the right-hand side. And the solid black line in both cases reflects this anticipatory response, this idea that if you forecast a stressor, so forecast is increasing, but the stressor itself does not happen, there's still an emotional cost to that. So the anticipatory process still has this emotional consequence. Uh, and that's true regardless of age. But what we found really interesting was that in the domain of home stressors, when younger adults were able to forecast, so they are able to see in the future or predict in the future that something stressful at home will happen, this was very beneficial for their mood. It um, reduced their negative affect. Whereas for older adults, there wasn't quite such a strong benefit as for the younger adults. And we feel like this could be related to Susan Charles strength and vulnerability integration theory, where she suggests that older adults have, or there, there are strengths and vulnerabilities that accompany aging. So the strengths of the older people in this case might be in avoiding the stressor in the first place. But once the stressor is no longer able to be avoided, then there's the vulnerability and how they may be able to respond. So in this case, that the forecasting is really beneficial for younger adults relative to older adults. We've also applied this to the uh, 2016 presidential election. We didn't necessarily set out to examine the impact of the election, but we just happened to be collecting data in October and November of 2016. So in October, we had 78 participants reporting on 645 total days. And then in the week surrounding the election, which took place on November 8th, 2016, we had 29 participants reporting on 235 days. So we compared the election sample and the comparison sample on their forecasted next day stressors, their actual stressors, and their negative affect. And what we see here on the vertical axis is again predicting negative affect um, or feelings of bad mood. In the comparison sample, the timing of the study, whether it was the beginning or the end of their study week, didn't matter. The black line and the dashed gray lines are nearly identical in terms of their overlap. But if we look at the election subsample on the right-hand side, the black line reflects the days after the election and the gray line reflects the days before the election. So this is within the same people, we see that there's an expected reaction to increases in stressors, negative mood um, also goes up, but this becomes even more pronounced and much stronger in the days after the election. So it's important that, to note that these are the same people, right? These within person slopes that describe reactivity changed and they increased in the days after the election. So what I'd like to do in the future is to dive into some data that we collected this year where we have uh, information from a Czech presidential candidate. This flag is from the Czech Republic. Um, so I was able to collect data from the presidential candidate himself in the campaign phase, the election phase, and the recovery phase after the election. And so this, uh, these lines reflect various health and well-being indicators. And you can see the data started to be collected in December of 2017. The election was a two-day election. It took place January 12th and 13th of 2018. And so we can look at trends and patterns of health and well-being in the campaign phase, the election phase, and then the recovery phase. And we have this information for the presidential candidate, uh, for his romantic partner. So we can see again the election phase 
uh, reflected here and the health and well-being indicators as they travel together over time. And then we also have the same information from the romantic or from the adult son of the candidate. So um, we're excited to, to get into these data and try to understand a very uh, stressful, but also um, intensely personal and relevant series of stressors that are related to, to going through the presidential election uh, of, as the candidate himself. So we've looked at the US presidential election. We're gonna look at the Czech presidential election. So this year, what we wanted to do in my lab was to look at the 2018 midterm election and do it intentionally. So I uh, was able to receive a grant to look at the campaign phase uh, that we, we began October 15th, leading up to the midterm election, which was on November 6th. And then to look at the recovery phase in the one week after the midterm election. And many of the elections uh, results were not known on November 6th. They uh, spilled over into the several days remaining. So we're excited to have a sample of about 140 people from across the US reporting on their daily experiences with uh, the election itself. Um, and to see how they respond as they as they move through this phase. So the last area I want to talk about is the uh, the time scales over which these processes happen, the short and long term intra individual variability. So this uh, quote is from John Nestle wrote the idea that the coexistence of two kinds of inter individual changes are key to really understanding everyday lives. So I've spent this talk talking a lot about intra-individual variability, this up and down kind of roller coaster variability, negative effect that can move up and down, stress can move up and down. Now the things that I'm looking at on a daily basis really do fluctuate and go up and down, but it happens within the context of longer term intra-individual change that unfold over decades um, and, and much longer time scales. So trying to integrate these two would be really important to understanding everyday lives. So I have an R01 with Tom Hess. That's a social cognition and aging grant from the National Institute on Aging, where we're trying to systematically look at inter-individual variability and change uh, over long time scales. So we have effort here, cognitive cost, uh, predicting intrinsic motivation, and we operationalize effort as uh, systolic blood pressure response. So we uh, have people come into the lab and we give them a series of cognitive tests and we look at their, uh, their blood pressure, their heart rate, and many uh, psychophysiological indicators as they are doing those testings. And then we um, index that as effort and we look to see if, uh, if that relates to their motivation to, um, to be involved in activities. So we see that, that is true that this uh, effort very much um, is related to their, their ability, their willingness to engage in activities. Um, and so we also wanted to look to see if aging attitudes, how people felt in general about their aging would mediate this relationship and we see that it does. So when people have more effort in terms of spending effort during cognitive testing, that relates to how they feel about their aging, which in turn relates to their motivation to be involved in various activities. What we'd like in the future for this project uh, to continue looking at these two different kinds of uh, intra-individual variability and change is to capture the ways in which the weekly assessments that we have after people leave the lab, where we ask about their activity engagement, um, how that may unfold. And so we ask them if they have participated in social activities or in cognitive activities, um, in physical activities. And so we have them answer these questions once a week for five weeks after they leave the lab. So we have this long-term change where we've at people, some of them have been in the study for 30 years. Um, so we have these longer term assessments and now we're able to match that with these shorter term assessments that happen on a weekly basis. Uh, we also recently received Alzheimer's, uh, an Alzheimer's supplement for this project with the goal to identify behavioral and physiological drivers that may slow or accelerate the trajectory of activities with cognitive impairment. So again, trying to predict activity engagement and so the first aim is to extend uh, Tom Hess's theory of selective engagement. So his set idea of selective engagement theory and its implications to Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So selective engagement is the idea that as it becomes more effortful to participate or to engage in cognitive tasks, 
that uh, people will dedicate their resources to what makes the most sense um, for them in terms of their goals. And so we're going to integrate chronic stress uh, to build a comprehensive model of cognitive impairment. And the way we're going to do that is to um, look at 100 people with cognitive impairment or related dementia, and we're going to have them view the same aspect as the, um, the parent project. And we are going to have them take the harmonized cognitive assessment protocol, which is used in the health and retirement study. Um, it's an expanded assessment of cognitive function that we can administer to the participants if they are able or to a proxy uh, respondent if they have someone who comes with them who can tell us about their cognitive functioning. And we're going to get at their chronic stress by taking their hair. So we're going to be using three centimeters of their hair, uh, shorter, obviously, if they don't have that long of hair, uh, to represent their total cortisol output in the past few months. So however long of hair we can get uh, will index their chronic stress and how their stress that they've experienced may relate to their cognitive functioning. So we will, of course, co-vary out the important things that will help us understand um, the chronic stress from the hair. And at that point, um, we're excited to go forward. So this is this is uh, where I will I will turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a yeah, pretty nice welcome. presentation. So I have one or two questions basically sure. uh, regarding uh, like have you looked at the like these are the individual people right like uh, whatever you have studies have done with the individuals have you looked at their families like as a family has a particular type of stress uh, stress response yeah that's a great question there's one study that i've done with keith whitfield it came out in i believe it came out in 2012 or 2014 the journal i think is ethnicity and disease where mm -hmm. we look at the intergenerational transmission of stress mm -hmm. and how that can influence um, cardiovascular health in African-American families. So that those data are from the Jackson Heart Study. Mm -hmm. And so that's an interesting paper where we show that um, uh, adults who have parents who experienced stress and who did not live very long, so had short lives, um, you know, have, have a response one way uh, to their own stressors. So yeah, that that is, is fascinating to me to think about uh, generations and how stress and response to stress can be transmitted through families. I also have done uh, some work with Jeremy Jorgensen, who is at BYU. Um, he's uh, very interested in marital relationships. So mm -hmm. couples within a couple, how do marital partners influence each other and how they respond to their own stress? So I've done some work like that, but I certainly credit my, my colleagues in being the, the driving force behind those kinds of questions. And uh, one more thing regarding uh, same like a marital thing, like there are like lots of in US, you have a uh, single family parents. Mm -hmm. So how the kids have like, they have gone through the stresses in their lives. How does it affect their long term well-being? Anything has been done on that? Like you have a single family kids, right, who are raised in single family. So they might have some stresses over period because having one person taking care of them. So their long term effect is then has anybody done on that? Any work on that? Yes, I um that that's not work that has been done directly in my lab. I am aware of, uh, of several bodies of work that might help with that kind of question. So there's some work on divorce in general. So parent, mm -hmm. families that may have started as two parent households, but then transition to be headed by a single parent. Um, there's some work on how, uh, how children can uh, have resilient outcomes. So mm -hmm. certainly it's not always the case yes. that um, having a, a single parent predicts necessarily how the child will deal with their own stress as a child, but then also as an older adult. Um, I did do one paper with Dave Almeida and Melanie Horn, uh, she's now Melanie Horn Mallers, where we asked people to retrospectively re report on the quality of their relationships with their parents when they were younger. So we asked them to report on the warmth and the understanding that they felt that they had from their parents. And um, adults who retrospectively report that relationships with their parents 
were better at handling stressors as an adult compared to people who felt that they had less warm or cold relationships with their parents. So I think that the quality of the relationship definitely is an important thing to consider. Um, and the structure of the family certainly may play a role. Uh, it may create some challenges, but certainly those challenges can be overcome. So I think that the quality is an important piece to remember. So anything on the genetics people have worked on, looked into, and the, how people cope with the stressors? Yeah, so Keith Whitfield, who's uh, now the provost at Wayne State University, does a lot of uh, behavior genetics work, and he does it within the context of the intergenerational transmission of mm -hmm. stress and how people respond to stress. So his work um, I think is is speaking to that kind of question that you raise, but yeah, it's it's a there's there's a lot of work to be done. We still don't understand um, all of the mechanisms, whether they're genetic or environmental, or certainly a combination. And coming to the last uh, your discussion on uh, Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. uh, like is there like because usually sometimes part of Alzheimer's is a kind of a genetic. There is a uh, I mean like some data on that. So how how do you look at uh, is there any like piece you are adding there or no it's just like uh, totally different than what you are looking into we aren't we won't be able to look at the determinants necessarily of alzheimer's disease its onset um ha potentially half of the sample that we will collect has been in the has been in a, a research study for decades and so we would know about their behavioral factors. Uh, many years ago and how that might relate to their subsequent diagnosis of impairment. But we will also be collecting data from new participants in the community. So we won't have that um, historical kind of information, but this grant is specifically looking at behavioral uh, aspects and the physiological predictor of cortisol from one's chronic stress. So we okay. won't necessarily be looking at uh, genetic factors, but that would, that would be something that would be a nice direction for future work. And uh, one more, this is the last one. Uh, regarding the, again, Alzheimer's, like parents are like, uh, you have your parents who have Alzheimer's. So is there any study done on like uh, looking at their kids or grandkids? Hey, how do they, like they might like, since there is a genetic component to Alzheimer's, how their that stress level eventually end up 10 years, five years down the road? Like any work has been done on that? I'm not aware of any. That doesn't okay. mean it doesn't exist. I'm not aware okay. of any, but I think it's fascinating, right? Because now yeah. people have the uh, relatively inexpensive possibility to have their genetic screening done by these yeah. companies that where you, you, know, you send in your cotton swab okay. with your saliva and they can yeah. tell you your health risk for something like Alzheimer's disease, late and early onset. And so I think it's a, it's a practical question what might be a predictor of someone being interested in knowing that information or wanting to avoid knowing that information? Mm -hmm. um, are there some, some fears or some anxieties that are very real in how people might approach that kind of information about their own personal health and what might be their personal health future? Uh, but then also may that be, may, could that be a stressor that stressor. someone is anticipating years in advance. Yep. That would be very interesting to know how people's thoughts about that potential upcoming, upcoming. Uh, diagnosis may influence their behavior right yeah. now. Yep. yep. So that would be interesting study too. I agree. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate your time. So it will be on our website uh, in next couple. Uh, already it will be there as soon as we are done, but it will be on the front page in the next few days. Great. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.